In today's video, we will reveal how John Carlo performed an incredible time traveling trick on Penn and Teller Fool Us. Let's do a quick rewind of what happened in the performance. John Carlo started off the performance by saying that he had brought a very special box with him because of what it had inside of it. He handed over the box to Ellison to hold on to it. He said that tonight he is going to prove that time travel is possible on the Penn and Teller Theater. And in case we succeed, we will need some kind of proof, something unique and one of a kind. He pointed to the spectator and said that's where he comes in. He had the spectator hold on to the permanent marker like so, such that he will be making a unique piece of art on a piece of paper, but with his eyes closed. He then had the spectator open his eyes and showed him what he had scribbled onto the paper. He had the spectator take out the cell phone he had on him. Asked the spectator to unlock it so that he could borrow it for a moment. John Carlo said that he wanted to make sure that he can recognize this drawing later, so he was going to take a quick selfie, he then sent that selfie to Penn's phone, so that he also had a copy of the image, John Carlo said that we will need a timekeeping device, upon which he opened up a stopwatch on the phone, which he then started. He placed the phone inside a blue bag and introduced his assistant which happened to be a stuffed platypus. He said that he had built a homemade time machine, which he uncovered by removing the black cloth from it. John Carlo placed the stuffed platypus inside of a time machine, alongside with the drawing that the spectator made in an envelope and the spectator's phone. He asked Teller to raise any fingers on his hand, indicating how many hours back to time travel. Teller raised two fingers. He then pulled the lid off and everything vanished from inside the wooden box. He said that these items had vanished back into the box which he ended over onto Allison before the act started. He then opened up the black box that Allison was holding to and pulled out the stuffed platypus, alongside with the drawing. That was the exact same drawing that the spectator drew, which John Carla verified by asking Penn to look at the picture he was sent on his phone. Finally he pulled out the spectator's borrowed phone from inside the blue bag, and asked him to unlock the phone, upon unlocking the phone and opening the stopwatch. The stopwatch showed that it had been running for the past two hours. Spoiler alert! If you accidentally clicked on this video and don't want to know how such tricks work, I will give you 5 seconds to click off this video but if you consider magic as a puzzle then stay tuned. Now before I get down to the reveal, I want to give a quick shout out to my wonderful patrons for supporting my work, their support is the reason I am motivated to upload more regularly. We will break the trick into two phases. In the first phase we will discuss all the observations I made that helped me in drawing a logical conclusion. In the second phase based on those observations, I will reveal how the trick works. Now, before we discuss the observations, let's see what Penn had to say about the performance. The first hint Penn gave was right here at this moment. My pen is running dry here. I mean, just another, just, my pen just went dry here. You can see at this moment Penn was trying to indicate something related with the marker that he used. Even Teller can be seen shaking his pen to grab his attention. The second hint Penn gave was right here at this moment. Uh, Doug the platypus was a wonderful helper, maybe not the only one, but he was... You can see Penn mention the platypus that Giancarlo used was a great helper, but not the only one. This statement itself is self-explanatory. Finally, the third hint Penn gave is right here at this moment. We know that all magicians are, are liars. There were a few lying things in there. You can see Penn said a few lines things in there indicating something related with the black box that he handed over to Allison. Before the performance started, something had been lying inside there. Now let's discuss the observations. The first observation I want you to take note of is that, in the beginning of the performance when he had the spectator draw a random image on the piece of paper, he had the spectator hold the permanent marker in front of him while keeping his eyes closed. Go ahead and close your eyes. This is pretty odd because the spectator could also have had drawn the image without having to have his eyes closed. Furthermore in this observation, you can see as John Carlos shakes the pad randomly back and forth to help him create a more random drawing. The second observation I want you to take note of, is while taking a photo of the random drawing the spectator made on the piece of paper, he made sure to not show the opposite side of a piece of paper right over here. The third observation I want you to take note of, is upon comparing the drawing before and after the reveal of the image having been apparently time-traveled, the drawing does look exactly the same, but the sides of the page does look nothing like each other. The fourth observation is related to the spectator's borrowed phone. If we were to compare the phone that Giancarlo initially borrowed from the spectator with the phone that he pulled out from the black box later on. Although the phones look very much alike, but upon careful examination we observe two major differences. 
The first difference is the percentage of battery on both the phones. You can clearly see the comparison, that initially the battery was lower than the battery of the phone after being taken out of the black box. Well since this isn't real magic to begin with, we have to make logical deduction that the phones had to have been different. To further support our first observation, you can compare the networks on both the phones. Both of them although cannot be clearly read, but based on the fonts, both of the networks are different. This leads us to conclude that the spectator's phone and the phone taken out of the black box were two distinct phones. The fifth observation I want you to take note of is that, both of the moments, the first being when he had the spectator pull out his phone, and the second moment after pulling out the phone from the black box, he had the spectator unlock the phone using the fingerprint detection option, which on iPhones is right on top of the menu button. The sixth observation I want you to take note of, is as John Carlo was placing the borrowed phone inside the blue bag. He immediately pulled out the stuffed platypus from underneath at a table. It is as if he had placed the spectator's phone inside the platypus. You can even see him holding the stuffed animal, as if he is holding a phone inside of it right here at this moment. Before we move on, I checked my stats and only 8% of you are subscribed. What the hell is here? Huh? And 92% of you aren't subscribed. You have got to be kidding me. So if you are enjoying the video then a sub to the channel will be marvelous. You're goddamn right. The seventh observation I want you to take note of, is when he is placing all three objects inside the wooden time traveling apparatus, you can see he appears to be placing the objects at an angle in some sort of slot inside the box, even though the box was empty and large enough for all three objects to be dropped easily inside it without any trouble. This raises suspicion that the wooden box might be gimmicked. The eighth observation I want you to take note of, is when he lifts up the lid from the top handle, he hides the bottom of the lid beside his right leg. The ninth observation I want you to take note of, is when he had asked Teller to raise any number of fingers on his hand freely to select how many hours back Teller wanted the apparatus to time travel. Teller freely selected the number two. The tenth observation I want you to take note of, is the wallpaper that was on the iPhone. If you were to do a quick search and see the default wallpaper of an iPhone, you can see that it is the default wallpaper of an iPhone 6. We can see it is the exact same wallpaper that was on the spectator's phone. The 11th and very important observation I want you to take note of, is that the spectator was standing beside John Carlo on stage before the act even started. We know for a fact that Fullis does not allow stooges, but it does raise a question as to why would John Carlo need a spectator standing already on stage with him, whereas he could have walked down to the studio audience, and have had any random spectator selected. Since he was using a borrowed phone, it would not matter whichever one he used to perform this trick, unless it really did matter. For those who think that the show was saving time and therefore had the spectator already on stage. I want you to ask yourself a question. Why in these two performances like a dozen others on Fool Us, the magician went off stage down to the studio audience and selected a random member? I need an assistant. Okay, you, can you come here please? Who can lend me a ring, please? <laughs> Whoa, so many people, let's go into the- Was not time for the show important during those episodes? And even if it was the case of saving time, then the spectator would not have been standing before the magician was even introduced onto the stage. They could have simply trimmed out the section where he had the spectator randomly selected by him or Penn and Teller themselves to come up on stage. If you have made it this far into the video, be sure to hit the like button, it really supports the channel. Also be sure to subscribe. I would really appreciate it, due to the time and effort I put into my videos. If you want to see more and more uploads, please support me on Patreon for a single dollar per month. I would really appreciate it wholeheartedly. Now let's get back to the explanation. Based on these observations, I'm pretty sure you had already figured out exactly how the trick works. I will now do a quick explanation to connect all the observations together, so they make sense. The first and foremost easiest trick was the platypus. Even Penn explained in his hint that John Carlo was using more than one platypus. Uh, Doug the platypus was a wonderful helper, maybe not the only one, but he was... So he simply had placed another platypus in the black box that he handed to Allison. The second most easiest trick is the one where he duplicated the drawing. The marker that he handed to the spectator was simply a dry marker. And this is exactly the reason why he had the spectator close his eyes, so he could not tell if the marker was writing or not. In reality the spectator was writing nothing on a blank piece of paper. Once the spectator finished writing, Giancarlo did a switch. 
The switch was basically pulling the page upon which Giancarlo had already made a duplicate signature from under the blank page. Giancarlo on purpose displayed the blank page on top to pen and teller to make it more convincing that the spectator was genuinely going to be writing on the blank page. Before the show Giancarlo simply had duplicated the same signature on two pieces of paper. But he left out a major mistake, which was that the side of the pages were completely different. In order for Penn and Teller to not notice and distinguish between the two pages, he made sure to take a picture such that the side of the page was not visible. So that he will get away with it. Now what remains is how did he vanish all the three props from inside the time traveling apparatus, and the second thing is how exactly the stopwatch was running two hours ahead of time. And finally, an observation we made that two different phones were used, raises a lot of questions, of how is it possible that Giancarlo knew the spectator would have a black iPhone 6 on him to begin with. Let's start by addressing the first question. If you were to see how he stuffed the three props into the box you would have already guessed that the three props were never really inside the box, rather there was a pocket inside the lid that held onto all three of the props. This is why as he was placing the third item, he had a little trouble pushing it inside, since the pocket was pretty much full to the top, this is also the reason why he did not display the bottom of the lid. Now I'll address the second and third question since they are interlinked together. In order to help you understand, I pointed out a very important observation, which was the very last observation, that the spectator was standing on stage even before Giancarlo was introduced. You see, the spectator as we know without a doubt, is not a stooge. But, the spectator was selected beforehand through a careful procedure, such that it does not fall into the category of cheating. You see, Giancarlo simply asked the producers of the show, before the show started, that he needed a spectator but the spectator will require an iPhone. All he did was go through all the spectators who had an iPhone and see which one had a black iPhone, that was an iPhone 6 and also had a default background of an iPhone 6. So once these three conditions were met, Giancarlo selected that spectator, this is the reason why the spectator was standing in front of Penn and Teller before the show started. Because normally a spectator is selected in real time in front of Penn and Teller, but it was not in this case. This logically means that the second phone was, John Carlo's black iPhone 6, since it was his own cell phone. He simply had created a pre-installed app that was customized for multiple outs. The multiple outs was designed such that it could run several stopwatches at the same time. So if Teller had selected any number from 1 through 5, each of the stopwatches had already started respectively 5 hours beforehand and counted down to 1 once Teller had selected the number 2. Finally, there is an important observation that I want to address before I end this video. It is the fact that how exactly did the spectator unlock the second iPhone, which was John Carlo's iPhone using his fingerprint. It makes us quickly assume that the spectator definitely had to be in on it since he had to have placed and registered his thumbprint into Giancarlo's iPhone. While you see this is once again simply not the case. In order to perform this convincing iPhone unlocking trick, all Giancarlo had to do was take a screenshot, while his iPhone was locked, the screenshot of the locked screen is now saved into the gallery. What he now had to do was go into the gallery and open the screenshot. By opening the screenshot, it makes it look like the phone is once again locked. When in fact, all Giancarlos was doing was displaying a screenshot. Now in order to create the illusion that the spectator unlocked the iPhone, he had the spectator touch the menu button. You can notice the spectator struggled for a moment. But then the moment he pressed the button down, it quickly unlocked by pressing down the menu button. The menu button takes it back to the home screen. It creates a perfect illusion, as if you had unlocked the phone. When in reality, you simply jump from the gallery screenshot to the home screen. If you liked what you saw be sure to hit the like button and feel free to comment which reveal you want to see next. Thanks for watching and as always have a great day.